go. Hello, everybody. This is the Non Sequitur Show. We are doing a live discussion and joined by two very knowledgeable, very prominent individuals that we'll introduce in just a second. Uh, we just wanted to make a couple quick announcements. Um, as I'm sure most of you now are aware, tomorrow we have a discussion between Aaron Ra and Kent Hovind, and they will both meet here for a discussion on the Facts for Evolution. Well, that's where we'll start. I can almost guarantee you that's not where we'll end up. There's no love lost between (laughs) these two, (laughs) and you don't want to miss that. The discussion between Doubt and Devout is tomorrow. That's March 1st at 7 p.m., 4 p.m. Pacific. And then um, next week we have Mark Curian on Monday. He is the founder of Beverly Hills Lifestyle Magazine. And we're going to be discussing his road to how he made that such a success, um, his refusal to accept defeat, and how his bumpy roads eventually turned into Rodeo Drive. And also next week, we have a really cool interview with Nate Dern, who is a senior writer at um, FunnyOrDie.com, which is extremely yeah. popular. And um, mm-hmm. we're going to discuss his new book that just came out, Not Quite a Genius. So, um, really cool things coming up, guys, and don't forget to join us tomorrow at 7. And now, I will turn it over to Steve, who will introduce today's discussion. Excuse me. Hey, well, welcome, everybody. We have Dr. Carrier with us back today. He joined us a couple weeks ago, if you guys remember. We had an awesome discussion with him, and he decided to come back. I don't know why yet, but no, he, he, I think he had a good time. Did he have a good time with that last podcast? Oh, yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. It but we great. decided to kind of match him up with one of our friends, uh, Dr. Kenny Rhodes, who's a theologian, and kind of have a back and forth discussion on eh, some of the historicity of Jesus, some of the concepts of God, and kind of have an organic discussion uh, between the two. So let me introduce them real quick. I, or actually, let me have them introduce themselves. Uh, Dr. Kerry, why don't you, you, you give yourself a little bit of time to, take, uh, to tell everybody who you are, your background, your education, and some of the uh, things that you've written about, and then we'll do the same for Dr. Rhodes here. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, Dr. Richard Carrier. I got my PhD in ancient history at Columbia University, um, various other graduate degrees there in the same field, and then I had my undergraduate work at UC Berkeley in history and classical civilizations. Uh, th- that's my degreed background. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I've published in both uh, contemporary naturalist philosophy and ancient history, both uh, all aspects of intellectual history. So history of science, uh, history of religion, uh, and uh, uh, hi- history of history, actually. So <laughs> historiography and ancient historians. So uh, I've written on a lot of those subjects. And of course, I'm, I'm renowned for, you know, being a, a, an atheist apologist, as you might say, <laughs> atheist evangelist. Uh, advocating for a coherent atheist worldview. I think it's important for atheists to be philosophers and actually think about what their worldview is built out of and and, whether, and, and examine it and think you know critically. So I do all of those things. Um, and of course, I've written on uh, on the historicity of Jesus, which is the first peer-reviewed book arguing that Jesus didn't exist uh, that's ever been published. There have been a lot of amateur works of varying quality or lack of quality uh, over the years, but uh, I'm the first one to actually turned it into something rigorous to actually present it to the academic community for consideration. Uh, that came out in 2014, uh, so we might talk about that. Uh, and then in relation to like the God stuff, uh, my first book, still a good seller, is Sense and Goodness Without God, which is a uh, subtitle, um, A Defense of Metaphysical Naturalism, which is all about what atheists should believe rather than, I mean, it has like 90 pages on what we don't believe, but most of the book is about what we should believe, our positive beliefs, rather than focusing on the negative. Um, and that's, uh, so that might come up too, uh, depending on where our conversation goes. And I've written many other books. So people who want to follow up, read my blog, uh, take my online courses, I teach one every month, uh, or follow my Twitter feed or my Facebook feed, all of that stuff you can find at my website, which is richardcarrier.info, and that's dot .info. So just my name, dot .info, and then everything's there. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. So, Dr. Rose, you want to kind of like tell people about yourself, too, um, what you've written, your, your background, your theological studies, and your position on the historicity of Jesus, which I could probably guess you kind of believe that it existed, I, I would assume, from your... <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, <okay>. I do. <laughs> well, I'm Kenny Rhodes. I taught high school science for 15 years. <laughs> oh, wait. I'm sorry. Wrong debate. That's wrong, my wrong, other Wrong skill. discussion. That's my other... <laughs> That's tomorrow, isn't it? <laughs> that is tomorrow, actually, yes. <laughs> that, that was that genius tomorrow. right there. That was genius. Oh, that's going to live on for perpetuity there. <laughs> well, that's, that's, 
that's that's the beginning of my dissertation too. So. You can actually you can actually leave now, Doctor Rose. <laughs> <laughs> Discussion over. Kenny one. <laughs> oh, go ahead. No, I, I'm I'm Kenny Rhodes, um, uh, husband of three young adults, uh, uh, or father of three young adults, uh, husband to Tammy. Been married for twenty four years. And I've uh, been a pastor for a long time. Uh, while I was in ministry, I worked on my degrees and finished with a PhD in theology. And I've written uh, a few books. Uh, one is uh, the, called The One Who Is, uh, The Nature and Existence of God. And so uh, that's uh, really the one that would be very academically oriented. I wrote a small book on... Uh, the reliability of scripture, and then contributed to a, a fairly large tome on systematic theology, uh, in which uh, contributors were uh, Norm Geisler, um, John Wickham, believe it or not, the guy who mm. wrote the Genesis Flood. <laughs> mm-hmm. I used to uh, be a disciple of his, and of course, uh, used to be a young earther, but turned from, <laughs> from that way. And... Um, uh, I, I uh, love music. I'm a, a drummer, a fairly proficient jazz fusion drummer. So wow. I spend half my time in academics and half my time playing music. So um, that that's who I be. Awesome. Let me, let me see if I can try to start off the conversation between you two, because obviously the crux of Christianity would kind of hinge on if Jesus existed or not. I mean, would it would be safe to say that if Jesus never existed, uh, Christianity lives or dies by that one single fact, whether he does exist or not. Absolutely. Would that be correct? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. that's how you could falsify Christianity, certainly. Okay, that, so, that would be true, I think, it would totally be true for Kenny's Christianity, but I actually know believing Christians who, who aren't believers in the history of the city of Jesus. Uh, one of them famously is Thomas Brody, who's a Catholic, uh, who, who has a whole chapter in his memoirs where he tries to explain how it still makes sense to be a Christian without a historical Jesus, and his idea is that the story of Jesus was a gift from God to sort of illustrate his mechanism of salvation that's actually more abstract than the actual literal text. So uh, really? there are interesting ways that you can do that. Uh, and another difference is, uh, to point out, is uh, I actually, in my book, um, there are a lot of like bad theories of the non-existence of Jesus, a lot of crank conspiracy theory uh, garbage stuff. But there, if you look at the most plausible version, it does argue that the first Christians believed Jesus existed, but in the same sense that Sa- they believed Satan was a historical person. They didn't think he was, nece- a theory, according to the theory, they didn't think that he was a historical person walking around on earth, but that he was someone who engaged in activities and fates uh, in the in above the earth, basically. So his war in heaven, uh, his being cast down to the upper atmosphere and setting up castles there and all that kind of stuff was the belief system at the time. But of course, we don't think, you know, us atheists and agnostics don't think that there was a historical Satan. But the first Christians definitely did. And so uh, in insofar as uh, the theory is Jesus' mythicism, it's only from the perspective of uh, atheists or secularists. A Christian could go back and say, like today, could say, yeah, actually, I believe in that version of Jesus uh, that you're describing in your theory, and still have, yeah, Jesus did was crucified by Satan in the upper air uh, in, a, in a distant realm, and it was learned by revelation that this had happened, and this created the atonement, and all of this stuff. So you could rescue the entire theory of Christianity and still be a believing Christian, and still buy into the, the Jesus myth as a model that I defend in my book. It's theoretically possible, it's just not at all going to be popular in, in contemporary Christian life, I don't think. Well, let's see, would that, would that work for, for you? Uh, Kenny, I mean, if, if that was the case, if you found out that Jesus didn't exist, he was not a real historical figure, um, would you be able to incorporate that, incorporate that into your belief system, or would that just falsify everything to you? Uh, certainly not in Christianity. Yeah, I think that would falsify everything if Jesus didn't exist. I think also, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead by God, uh, Christianity is also falsifiable. So, um, Christianity what? is a faith... What? What, what if, for okay. example, you found out, like, what if, uh, like, for, uh, hey, let's suppose we all die, and then you, you end up, you're in heaven, and then you go, holy shit, this is real, uh, and then God explains, oh, by the way, the death and resurrection of Jesus was real, it just took place somewhere else in the heavens, it didn't take place on earth, that would still be compatible with your Christian belief, and you say, oh, we're just mistaken about where it happened. Would you think that makes sense? Uh, or Not, a, not in a, a biblical sense. Uh, you know, right. the scripture, when it speaks about a resurrection, it's literally, uh, you know, a getting up again of the physical body. 
so uh, that, there's, of course, you know, the, the neo-Orthodox guys, Boltman and Barth and the existential theologians, of course, you know, um, I heard Dr. John Gershner say that uh, um, uh, to, to put uh, the existential theologians uh, to the effect that uh, there is no God and Jesus is his son. You know, just just <laughs> utter irrationality, um, and, and so you yeah, could yeah. find a lot of irrationality uh, in the world today. And and uh, I'm just a straightforward, um, you know, reasonably literalist when it comes to interpreting the text of Scripture. Yeah, so, that's uh, what I was going to ask: is how how literalist are you in in, in respect to the Gospels? Say, like, do, do you think it's all historically accurate, or do you think some of it is symbolic? Uh, some, or do you think some of it might be inaccurate oral transmission, or like what's your take on those different options? Oh, I'm I'm, cer- I'm certainly an, an eratist. Uh, I believe that, uh, uh, of course, when we interpret the document, we interpret it like any other document. So you make room for you know figurative language, things like that. Uh, so I call it a normal literalism or a, a reasonable okay. literalism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, some of the other belief systems out there, Mormonism, they take kind of a a literalism or a wooden-headed rigor, uh, uh, rigorous yeah. look at Jesus, <laughs> or a God having, uh, you know, arms and legs and eyes and things like that. So, <laughs> right. Yeah, be, being yeah. a Thomist, those things would simply be anthropomorphisms for me. Yeah. Um, you know, metaphors, things like that. So, but uh, reasonably literal. And, yeah. Uh, well, how, yeah. what do you do with uh, things like um, the le- the long ending of Mark sixteen, right? So you have the the ending at Mark six eight or sixteen eight, and then there's the extended ending. Do you think that's authentic? Do you think that was a forgery added later? Like, what's what's your take on that? I, I, I imagine you know, like most Bibles say that it's not in some manuscripts, et cetera. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I'm of the opinion that it's not uh, original. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I'm a I'm a, a conservative evangelical. Um, but I, I've also done my homework, and so I'm not going to defend the King James Bible. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, okay. Oh, that's so you yeah. do both agree there are parts of the Jane, King James Version that probably are not authentic or have been either altered or just not um, accurate, to say the least? Is like that all both? of it? <laughs> Spoke like a true atheist well, over there. Uh, no, but well, you do, know, guys, do you both you agree on that? the issue... Uh, you know, the manuscript evidence, uh, Desiderius Erasmus wasn't working with uh, uh, too many manuscripts. He back-translated the Latin uh, into Greek uh, for the book of Revelation. He, he even made up some words uh, in order to, uh, you know, put together the manuscript for the book of Revelation. Uh, we call that the Textus Receptus, but there are many Textus Recepti out there, um, but... It would also. There's really three main schools out there as far as biblical manuscripts. You've got uh, the majority texters, you've got the critical texters, and then you've got the guys that follow the TR, which would be uh, a certain kind of King James onlyist. There, uh, there are yeah. uh, like D. A. Waite. He he would defend the Textus Receptus, uh, which version of that I'm not sure, but he would defend you know the authenticity of say uh, uh, John eight. Um, Mark right. 16, things like that. Uh, so you've got some weird King James only <laughs> like Kent Hovind, yeah. who would defend right. uh, King James as the inspired word of God to English Word for word. People. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's similar to the, the legend of the Septuagint, right? That the, they took the seven. This is, you know, King Ptolemy and Alexandria. This is the legend. Sure. It's probably not true, but uh, he took the, the 70 rabbis and had them, locked them all in separate cells and had them translate the Pentateuch separately. And when they all came out and compared their texts, their texts were exactly, exactly. literally identical. Yeah. And that proved that the, the translation was inspired by God. And so, therefore, the Greek translation was itself an inspired translation. So, yeah, it's kind of like they're doing the same thing with the King James Bible. It, nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. As a matter of fact, the, the Puritans, uh, they, uh, one Puritan wrote that he'd rather be rent in two by horses than to have that modern King James Bible thrust upon the church. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> Harsh. Yeah, they were serious they, about that. They yeah. used the, the, the Geneva Study uh, Bible there, uh, oh, the yeah. Geneva translation, yeah. 
So let me ask you two, why, how, why is it or how is it that both of you are very educated, both of you are well um knowledge about these topics, but you end up coming to the grossly different conclusions based upon what you both evaluate as evidence, especially when it comes to the literal uh, existence of Jesus. I mean, that I don't, I, I can see there's textual issues where people can say, okay, these are salvational issues here, or this might not be correct here, or this passage might be even changed here, but we're talking about a fundamental thing in Christianity, as well as what you had brought up about the resurrection of Jesus and those things, but the existence itself very fundamental. How, how is it that both of you have arrived at very different conclusions by reading the same types of evidence? Which I, I guess I'll jump out of that first. Mm -hmm. sure. um, you know, it, it's interesting. I think it has to be in, in the world of presupposition, uh, epistemology. Uh, I think it, it starts there. Um, and uh, I wanted to throw this out there. I have read one of uh, Dr. Carrier's books, and that was the one that, um, why he wasn't a Christian. Is that, is that the title of that? Dr. Yeah, Carrier? why I'm not a Christian. Yeah, yeah why I'm not a Christian. Yeah, and that's I actually a nice, read easy 90-page book. Yeah. Yeah, I actually <laughs> read that book in the midst of my own existential crisis of belief. And the reason why I did that is I wanted to make sure that my belief in God was not um, emotional emotional. It wasn't uh, just because I was raised in church, but I really wanted to deal with the hard issues. I had, I had some significant questions about faith. I had started drinking again. This is about three years ago. And uh, just wanted to say, hey, you know, I, I was kind of mad at God over the issue of evil and suffering. And uh, I read his book just to make sure that I didn't have any emotional reasons why I was believing or why I was hanging on to this and and so um, what was interesting what saved my Christian faith was just the issue of apologetics and knowing um, you know for certain um, and I use that in quotes you know f of the existence of God and things like that the the general reliability of Scripture the the fact that Jesus did live and uh, I've just I've just thought recently that you know a lot of these things. Uh, can be uh, emotionally driven, experientially driven, why we would give up our beliefs in God. But I think a lot of it has to do with epistemology. And uh, so I spend a lot of time in metaphysics and epistemology because I think it's really important uh, where we're starting off at. Uh, not, not as a presuppositionalist uh, kind of looking at worldviews, but, but really, um, you know, asking those questions of, of knowledge and how we know and where we're our, our starting base. And uh, I know, Steve, I know you're a foundationalist, and so that's kind of where I start Good memory. As, as well. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody remembers an actual position that they got right for me. Awesome. Uh, usually it's on, they're all over the place. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, think, I think that's true. Ahead. I think our foundations, our worldview foundations are important in that regard. Um, and, and I do, yeah, it does come down to epistemology and, 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 uh, and, like you said, not really presuppositions. These are conclusions we've arrived at, but from other fields of study, other areas of contemplation. Uh, and in, in fact, so in the case of the historicity of Jesus, which is probably like a distraction issue, we could focus on like the resurrection of Jesus to be a more mainstream example. But uh, I used to be a historicist. I was like, I was one of these guys telling people that these mythicists are crazy, that their arguments are stupid, and they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, it, it took me six years of like serious study, uh, specifically on the subject, to really change my mind on that conclusively. Uh, and even that, I my conclusion is it's more probably than not. I don't actually think it's I can be certain that Jesus didn't exist. I give him a one in three chance uh, of having historically existed, which is actually a respectively high probability. It's just lower than most mainstream scholars would assign to it. But yeah, that took me a while. And so and and there's two factors there. Is one is I really focused on that. Uh, issue really strongly and critically for a long time. And then the other is I didn't come at it with any need to believe any particular conclusion was true. Like, it, it's no skin off my back if there was a mundane apocalyptic prophet named Jesus who got glorified later, uh, or if he didn't exist. So both of those options. So I was able to, like, look at it without either lens. Like, I could put on both lenses freely and not. It would, it's not a challenge or a threat to my worldview. Uh, and so I think those two things together is what led me in a different direction uh, than, than most people who've looked at this evidence. Uh, and the question I would have is, uh, like, so if one of these key suppositions, and it's not a presupposition, I realize, like, you arrived at it uh, through argument and reasoning, but you say... Um, 
Kenny, uh, reliability of scripture. So that's, that's, the, that's an example of something that you're starting with that I'm not starting with. Uh, so right. why, right. What, what convinces you of the reliability of scripture in, as distinct from any other ancient book, which you probably would not regard with the same trust, uh, for example? Well, you know, of course, that, that uh, the reliability of scripture is certainly grounded upon the fact that God exists. And that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus. you know, uh, the proposition God raised Jesus from the dead is certainly probable and reasonable uh, if God exists. And if God doesn't exist, the proposition God raising Jesus from the dead is, is you know, irrational. So it starts from a foundationalist um, argumentation toward the existence of God and then looking for evidence in the world if this God has indeed showed signs that he has revealed himself. And so when we get to jump ahead to the reliability of the New Testament, um, the fact that they were written down within the generation of the first eyewitnesses, and they were written down in an oral, Eastern oral community that had checks and balances, uh, what Bailey terms a... Uh, formal, controlled oral tradition. Uh, it's, it seems just infallible to me that uh, Jesus uh, was a, uh, a mythical uh, person, and that uh, Paul especially. Uh, I'm going to, you know, uh, seed some facts in the sense that I won't be appealing to uh, those Pauline epistles that that some say he didn't write, you know, the pseudo uh, mm. Uh You know, but I think if we just take 1 Corinthians, there's great evidence that he is uh, talking about the fact, he uses that technical language of uh, receiving and passing on, and then, of course, you have, as Habermas speaks about, that triple OT clause, and that, and that, um, that this, this has been dated back to within two to five years of the resurrection itself. So issues like that, that, that Pauline epistles are uh, written down within 25 to 30 years of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you ask me about 30 years ago and ask me my first band in high school, I can do pretty good with remembering. And uh, if uh, I lived something out uh, and was a disciple... Uh, like the early disciples, you better believe they remembered 30 years later. And of course, later, and of course, it was in a community uh, that had those checks and balances. It's not like the telephone game that we all all play. That would be uh, what Bailey or uh, 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 Gerish Hostin, I think, is his name, um, what he termed uh, informal, uncontrolled uh, oral tradition. So um, that's. You know, without uh, sitting here and going off into a monologue about it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you know where I, you know you're a smart man. Yeah. I have a friend of mine, good man, a good friend of mine, who's an atheist, and I told him I'd be talking with you, and he goes, uh, "Good luck." <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he didn't leave me with any confidence. Wow. Uh, you know, he said, uh, "Dr. Carrier's a genius," and and uh, and so I said, "Well, you know, I'm just uh, I, I just go to talk uh, person to person." and uh, have a cordial conversation uh, and hopefully gain a friend uh, throughout the situation, but just to discuss these issues. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I much more enjoy the uh, collegial discussions rather than the, the combat of debating. Uh, sometimes you have to do the combat of debating, but, uh, but these are nice, right. too. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, you just listed a bunch of examples of, of more of these fundamental differences. So, for like, like, the... the the Gospels being written down within a generation, or within the same generation, that, I'm assuming you're, you're dating the Gospels then pre-Jewish War? Uh, yeah, uh, John A.T. Robinson, in uh, redating the New Testament, uh, okay, yes, actually uh, dates all of that's the... An example all of, of the, that's an example of a, of a fringe position. Uh, you know, most mainstream scholars put the Gospels after the Jewish War, uh, which would put them after uh, any known eyewitness would have been alive. So... Uh, based on average lifespans of the time, so that's see, I, I start there from the the suppositions of the uh, the conclusions of mainstream scholarship, which date the Gospels a generation later. What, what, what do you so call it? What do you call it mainstream? Uh, so I know what, well, what do you call it mainstream? Uh, 
everyone who's not a fundamentalist and even mo in this case even most fundamentalists <laughs> okay. uh yeah right so if you look at any, uh, stan any like standard Craig reference lomberg would not hold that view well, yeah, that's an example of someone who's on the fringe of that. But if you look at, you know, Erdman's Dictionary of the Bible, Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church, uh, New Interpreter's uh, Bible, uh, there's, you know, pick any standard uh, commentary, any major reference that's a standard peer-reviewed reference in the field, they're going to tell you that the mainstream, the communist view held by most scholars, both believers and non-believers, but especially all non-believers, uh, puts the Gospels at... Uh, after the Jewish War, with some uh, exceptions. There are some scholars uh, who try to date it earlier, although a lot of that, they, they, you can't really conclusively prove those earlier dates. They m more just argue for the possibility of those earlier dates. Uh, but that's a sure. difference. Yeah, that changes how we look at this um, right. as to what, what the evidence is. Like, if the Gospels were written themselves, if they were written within, like, a couple years of the, the supposed advance, then I think that we'd have a good case for historicity. It's the fact that we but can't... What, what really about the oral community they came from? Well, that's another example. Um, uh, th that's always just been a declaration. It's never actually been demonstrated that that existed. Uh, the fact that you can have a community like that doesn't mean there was one. And I'll give you an example. We, we know, for instance, that the, the only example of that that the Jews had was the Mishnah schools. Uh, so the Mishnah was transmitted orally, which was, the Mishnah was supposedly the oral Torah. In legend, it was all the commandments Moses gave that he didn't write down, uh, that he supposedly handed on orally. Probably didn't come from Moses, but whatever it was, it was a collection of laws uh, that had to be memorized orally, and they had schools. You would start as a kid at age seven and spend like years and years and years memorizing the Mishnah, memorizing the Mishnah, memorizing it. And then you would spend years in courts relying on it. Uh, so you, that's where you get this reliable tradition. You have an institution in place that's basically getting kids and drilling them on this. Uh, and then you have a community that's policing it where we have evidence of this being the case. We don't have evidence of any such institution uh, within Christianity at all. Uh, so we can't presuppose that there was one. Uh, and when we look, of course, we look at the Gospels, we see enormous variations in what's, how, what version of the story is being told. So even there, there's not uh, really reliability. And the Gospels are in Greek, so they're, not, they're clearly not... Uh, as is from the original community at all. Someone has translated these things into other languages. Uh, so this, you know, we're talking foreign language in a foreign land, uh, trying to represent stories that theoretically come from somewhere, but we can't even establish that those stories actually come from anywhere, as opposed to being literarily crafted. So that that's so that would be a different supposition where I'm starting from. Sure. And I have reasons sure. why I reach that conclusion, but that's that's sure. why that you can see where just that right. is going to send us on radically right. different. Now, uh, now what, where would you hold uh, Papias? as a um, as a existing individual who uh, writes of the fact that he um, talked to the people that sat at the feet of the gospels and uh, he even he doesn't actually even he doesn't really say that yeah Papias doesn't actually uh, John say the that. elder yeah he does he talks about John the elder he talked to Philip's daughters um, you know uh, church tradition holds that John lived. Uh, into the 90s, and uh, Papias talks about the fact that Matthew was written first in Hebrew. Well, we know that's not true, though. Not our Matthew. Well, how, how do we know our, that? Our Matthew copies Mark verbatim and uh, draws either adds to that or draws on the Q document, which we also know was in Greek. Uh, so Matthew's entire contents comes from Greek, uh, Greek sources. Well, There's no Hebrew that, behind that. That's kind of an assertion on your part. We've got a guy by the name of Papias, who is well, living no, no, it's, we, we is actually a third have generation our, Christian. So are, are you a Matthean first? Uh, do, you, do you think Matthew's think, first and then Mark is a, think, is a redaction of Matthew? I think all four of them are, uh, for the most part, independent. I see. So you don't think Matthew used Mark, that there was some other Greek source that's exactly identical to Mark that Mark used and Matthew used, which is still a Greek source. Because they're verbatim, so they clearly, well, it's not by accident. They didn't just accidentally write exactly the same words in the exact same order. Well, I'm, I'm suggesting pages. there's enough difference to uh, validate the claim that they are eyewitness testimony that's been written down within an oral community. Uh, controlled well, that, that can't within be that true community. in Greek, though, because Greek is a translation. So who, who translated it? I mean, you're assuming that somehow, magically, people completely separate. This is another Septuagint miracle that somehow separately people unbeknownst to each other translated this hebrew tradition into greek and ended up with exactly identical greek texts independently well, these, these, are, these are these are these are apostles who are eyewitnesses who certainly 
spoke Greek, well, used the Septuagint. Why are they identical? That's, that's what I don't understand, is the, the, the text of Matthew and the text of Mark. I mean, in any other field of history, in any other subject in history, we know that's copying or common source. There, no one would suggest that they spontaneously, independent of each other, wrote down exactly the same words in the exact same order for pages and pages, right? Well, that's, uh, so that's I'm fascinating confused. because... I'm just confused it's, what, your, what your position well, is. Well, that's actually. fascinating because it seems like... Uh, uh, the accusation is that they are so different that there's all these contradictions. Well, there are also contradictions, but there are also... So are they the same or are they different, though? They're both. <laughs> are they they're identical both. or are they different? No, no. Oh, come on, they're, the, they're both things. Because you have huge stretches of text that are identical, and then suddenly Matthew changes something. That creates a contradiction, and that's what makes Matthew not Mark. That's how Matthew is different from Mark. Uh, but there are some oh, yeah, stretches I'm familiar of with all their... that are identical. And there's large stretches of text that are identical between Matthew and, and Luke as well, in Greek, uh, which means they have to have used a common source or each other. Uh, and either way, it's a Greek source, not a Hebrew source. There may have, maybe some uh, it, Hebrew it or Aramaic in there somewhere way back, but it, it's clearly it not the source there yet. It doesn't mean that there's a common core of history there that they're telling that would have been well, uh, what memorized that, by the disciples. There has Jesus to be some had common... mnemonic devices within what he was teaching, what he's saying, and this... this but it has to be a of, common single person, one single source who created the Greek translation that they're using, right? That's the only way that they could be identical in the Greek. They, they can't be orally transmitted and just magically be the same. There had to be one translator that they're working well, apparently from. You, apparently you don't know much about an oral community, then, if you're making that assertion. Oral no, communities it's, it's, are going to have... Translation. They didn't start in Greek, right? So they didn't start teaching the gospel in yeah, Greek. They, they were teaching yeah, they Hebrew. did. Yeah, they started so in Greek. Th sure they I did. see. So you think literally from the beginning it was all in Greek? The disciples, Jesus, they were Hellenist Jews, and they and then they, so they, the disciples Greek. coordinated amongst each other and said, "Okay, so uh, we're going to tell exactly the same Greek text, word for word, same order, everything." Okay, go forth. And then they sent the missionaries out, and that's where the Greek text comes from? That's your theory, is what you're saying? Well, I, I'm saying that the Greek text comes from the fact that eyewitnesses wrote down this core of history that in were Greek. memorized within... Well, we're told Matthew wrote in Hebrew, but what, that's what why would... That doesn't make what, sense. How, how could well, Matthew have been written in Hebrew and been translated into Greek, and yet Mark has exactly the same Greek? I mean, you would have to propose that Mark was copying Matthew. I, I just don't see why uh, there are forty percent difference in all the Gospels. Yeah, but we're and talking about the, the the parts that are identical. The parts that are identical can't be identical by accident. Um, so yeah, I'm just trying to I'm trying to understand uh, what your theory is. Is how did Mark and Matthew both get huge chunks of text that are identical word for word in Greek? Um, that's not possible if Matthew was translated from Hebrew. Unless you propose that, that Mark is a copy or a redaction of Matthew. Well, then you I, have Hebrew, then you have Matthew, then you have Mark. I'm proposing that just as Papias suggests that there was a very early Matthew, it didn't necessarily need to be uh, copied by Mark. Uh, Mark, we know, was the uh, amanuensis of Peter through church tradition. And uh, so we have Peter's accounting. Uh, I, I see them as, as three basically independent retellings of a core of history that was in a oral tradition uh, that had a significant amount of this stuff memorized. If you look at uh, the Greek, I'm sure you have. Jesus spoke they, they, in neither. They he spoke be. in ways they that could be, be memorized. can't be independent if they're identical. The Greek is identical. That proves that they're not independent, history, that they have so. one source, one person crafted. The, the parts that are identical across Matthew, Luke, and Mark, for example, one person had to craft that. It can't have been multiple people. And they had to have crafted it in Greek. Why, why can't um, I independently write down the lyrics of Tom Sawyer by Rush, and Steve do the same thing, I need to think that somehow we must have got together in order to uh, but, write out no, the Rush, 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 Rush wrote it. <laughs> well, it was it's actually, right. it was actually uh, Kitty Lee and Neil Peart, by the way, but one of my all-time yeah, favorite was, songs in history, right. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, but what, all, I'm, yeah. all I'm saying is that uh, and and we're probably getting bogged down here, and and probably no, need. I'm, to I'm, on, not, I'm confused. But I don't you can never go wrong talking about Rush. So continue. <laughs> That's debatable. <laughs> oh, 
Oh yeah, I forgot. The one person in the planet that doesn't like Rush, Kyle. <laughs> well, I have a different fact we could go on then. Um, the because uh, the other question was the the one Corinthians thing, right? So uh, there's a lot that we that could be said about that. But the one thing that I have a difficulty with, and a lot of scholars, I'm not the only one. You have Ludeman and others. Um, is the the assumption that what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15 is exactly what's in the Gospels. And, of course, you're working from that assumption that you get to from some argument. Uh, but I think a lot of scholars don't assume that that's the case. They assume the Gospels are developed tradition. And what, what Paul is referring to, he doesn't talk about, for example, Jesus eat, the resurrected Jesus eating with people or hanging out with them for days on end. Right? He only talks about, like, momentous visions. And, in fact, only one occasion... He says that they're all, he, they appeared to all of them at once, uh, and to hundreds of people all at once. But we don't know what he means by appear. Uh, so he doesn't give us a description. Does he mean a light in the sky that people interpreted as Jesus? What exactly does he mean? And that's, this is you the know problem. What, do, you know what the Greek is? do you know what the Greek is right there, right off the top of your head? I don't. I'm asking. Oh, talking about the appeared, or which yeah. part? Uh, Ophthe. Yeah, appears. Which, yeah, it's Ophthe. Which, Ophthe, which is uh, oh, okay. passive, passive of to see. It's common for uh, uh, visions. A lot of visions are referred to as as when gods appear or manifest. They're often the the verb of sure. can be used. For that. Sure, right. So you're suggesting that First Corinthians 15 that Hamber Mass speaks about um, in his minimal facts that right. most the majority of New Testament scholars uh, hold to these minimal facts, and one of them is that. Uh, um, that Paul is, is what he received, he's passing on of uh, holy tradition in the same manner. Paul was a Pharisee, uh, and so he's well, that's, receiving... That's not one of the minimal facts. I thought you were going to say the appearances were the minimal facts. That, no. That I think is true. Well, um, well, I'm just, I was just referring to Hambermas, and then in, in the context of him talking about that, he talks about First Corinthians yeah, 15. But, uh, I mean, we we could talk about whether what he means there in terms of received tradition, but but the, the problem, sure. the conundrum that we face as historians is what received tradition it, it, was it the same as in the Gospels or was it something else? Uh, you know, the Gospels are you know a whole lifetime later uh, by ancient standards, so we really can't necessarily connect them. We can't tell that Paul what Paul meant by the tradition that he was handed on, or if that was the case, uh, that what these people saw it, is the same thing as what gets narrated in the Gospels. We can't connect those two. We don't have the necessary data we would need to connect those two. Um, like, we couldn't do it in a court of law, for sure. Uh, this stuff would be thrown out uh, as hearsay uh, by standards of federal evidence. But I think, uh, I think Simon Greenleaf uh, would disagree. Yeah, but I... Who, who, was a, uh, who made Harvard Law what it is today, back yeah, in the day. <laughs> he was ignoring the federal rules of evidence, which you can just Google that, federal rules of evidence, and you can actually look it up uh, as to what's required to authenticate a document for it to be presented in court. The Gospels don't pass. Uh, so um, I'll have to look into that. But again, well, there's a lot but, of assertions you've made that I'm gonna, yeah. I would like to okay, look yeah, into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. definitely. Federal rules of yeah. evidence. Uh, what, what, what does it take for a document to be entered into court? You can read all about it online. You'll find that the this requirements are extremely strict. Uh, in fact, they're too strict for ancient history in general. So ancient historians, even for secular sure. history, can't abide by the the standards of evidence in a in a court of law, which means we accept that our results are less certain. Uh, so that that's a common thing. Is like like we don't have the confidence and certainty uh, that we would have in the result of a court trial, for example. But that's so do we you know throw out all all ancient history? Do you throw no, that no, out? We, we approach it from a case by case basis and, and degrees of uncertainty. So. Uh, there's lots of things that we trust, but we don't trust it like we're not going to bet our lives on it because we know there's a lot of ways this evidence can come to have been compromised. Um, so, so we have, and we have degrees of confidence depending on what type of evidence we're dealing with, what type of claim sure. we're dealing with, and so on. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's not a straightforward like we accept or reject. It's a yeah. question of analysis. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm. While I disagree, um, you certainly uh, uh, pause uh, for a moment and. Uh, take account when you disagree with somebody who that's their profession and that's their expertise. So, um, you know, I, re I respectfully, you know, disagree with you on a lot of what you said, but I'm going to look into it. Um, you, you might find you it interesting. Know. I just published an article on my blog, uh, like last week, I think, uh, on um, the evidence for Hannibal versus the evidence for Jesus. Um, now, you would disagree with how I categorize the evidence for Jesus, so that's fine. But sure. the, you'll yeah. find interesting to see why, what conclusions we come to regarding the existence of Hannibal and why, and the different kinds of evidence. And there are different levels of quality. Some are better evidence 
some are worse evidence. It depends, right? So there's different qualities. Sure. Different. And so sure. um, you, you might find that useful if you want to see like how historians actually look at these things. That that's one place to start. Um, and and it, like I said, it is our evidence situation for ancient history is worse than courts of law. So <laughs> right, right. Well, here's the thing: when when we talk about this stuff, uh, you know, I'm going to be quoting the guys that you've directly debated. So you uh-huh, know, I'm going to yeah. quote Lacona. <laughs> I'm going to quote Habermas. Uh, you know, so uh, in this instance, I can only say, uh, you know, with a smile, I disagree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Right. But but. But yeah, so if I can pose some questions to you just to kind of yeah. get back maybe a little further with some, you know, uh, epistemology starting points. Mm-hmm. Um, you said you're an atheist. Um, were you ever a theist? Um, what, what, what's your history as far as, uh, you yeah. know, your relationship to theism yeah, pe- people who want the whole story, I have a whole chapter on it in Sense and Goodness Without God, uh, so you can get all okay. the details there. Um, yeah. I was I was like a really vague theist when I was a child, uh, but then I also thought trees had souls and I could talk to them. So <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't really take that seriously as, as, a, as a reasoned position. Uh, my only my only true faith that I've ever had, the only religion that I really believed in, uh, and I wasn't I was nominally Christian because my family went to church and stuff, but I was they didn't require me to believe, and I didn't really have a faith belief in Christianity. And the church I went to wasn't didn't really require that. Either. It was very liberal. It was just the moral message was more important than the literal stuff. So uh, my first real religion, though, I was converted by a powerful religious experience that I would call at the, would have called at the time a miracle uh, to Taoism. So I was a, a believing Taoist for many years, all the way into my military service. Uh, in fact, I that was my stated religion uh, in service was Taoist, uh, and I went to boot camp with my own handwritten Tao Te Ching. Uh, as my religious text. Uh, and I, I did meditation, I experienced altered states of consciousness, I studied the philosophy, um, and it, I really, I have good feelings about what that religion did to me. Like, it, it taught me a lot of things, made me a calmer, better person, uh, made my life happier. Uh, and then I realized it was false. It took me a while to come to that conclusion. Uh, I wasn't angry that I'd been misled, but I, it just it just led to an evolution in my thinking, um, which is different. My experience is different from a lot of atheists who come from a fundamentalist background, uh, and then get really angry because they've been lied to their whole life is how they feel, right? right. Uh, and right. Um, I didn't have that sort of hostile experience. And it was until later in life uh, when I became an adult and a voter that I started to run into the problem of fundamentalism where all the social issues I'm trying to fight for, uh, the people in my way at the time were always Christians. Uh, and so that, that was sure. a new phenomenon for me that I had to like figure out. So I, I like came late to that uh, thing. And, and at that time I was a Taoist uh, and I just came to atheism later. Um, but at, at the, and that was in, at the same time getting involved in my interaction with religion more uh, as an atheist. Those, those all evolved at the same time. Uh, and then later, eventually, I started you know, becoming an atheist activist, You know, was editor-in-chief of the secular web for some years and things like that. And, and gosh, I'm talking ancient now, history. This is like 20 now, years ago. Taoism <laughs> is fundamentally atheistic anyway. There's no belief in a... It's hard uh, to categorize, being. yeah, because it's not a personal being, but it is still the belief in a force or power. Force, a, yeah. Yeah, it's more like an yeah. organic consciousness or a vegetative consciousness. It, it does take yeah. the role of God in many ways, but it, it is not so a... So you were, you were a you Jedi, a or uh, were What's you that? just a Padawan, or were you Seth a Jedi Lord. master? There, well, you know, obviously, <laughs> there, are, there are similarities because they based Jedi oh, yeah, religion yeah. On, on Eastern religion, so there, there are... Yeah. They, that's that's the ancestry there, but uh, no, I was sure. yeah. I was doing the real thing. So <laughs> now, now, just for clarification, because I've had this discussion with Kenny before, but Kenny, you you come from a, th- a classical theist point of view, right? If somebody doesn't accept the yeah. classical version of a of a of a god, right. then you would not consider them to be a theist, even if they have a god belief, correct? Right. I, I, to, to me, uh, yeah. It, ontologically speaking, we're talking about atheism is a non-belief in a god who is classically defined in the way the monotheistic religions would classify god or define god so, so under that, under that uh, paradigm the deist would not be a theist what what did you right, say right exactly yeah i'm sorry i couldn't hear uh, what what was that you want to repeat yourself on uh, that kenny no, I mean you. Oh, uh, uh, oh I said uh, yeah. under under the under Kenny's classical theistic approach, a deist, even though a deist would have right. a god belief, would not be considered to be a theist, which is confusing to some people okay. uh, under well, classical theist poly- approach. What about polytheists that have more gods that are more like super aliens? 
like the uh, like the Mormon, right. like Mormon, right. like Mormonism even is right. could, is similar to that, right. really. Right. Uh, well, yeah. So in that sense, how do you classify that? Is what my question is. Oh, they would be polytheistic for sure. Yeah. Okay, but not theistic is what you're saying. Is, is... well, well, the the term atheist was coined in response to the monotheistic monotheistic uh, belief system, the three main monotheistic religions, Judaism. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's true. I mean, it depends on what you mean. Uh, I mean, atheos, the Greek word, was used even before Christianity existed and outside the context of Judaism. Like the, the uh, non-believers uh, in, you know, pagan non-believers or non-believers in pagan communities were called atheos uh, and atheoi. Right, right. well, um, the, the, uh, the accusations against her, the Christians were that they were atheists, homosexual uh, cannibals. Yeah, you know. yeah. Well, so. actually, that, that's what we hear from Christians, uh, which is interesting. When, when you look at the actual pagan critics, they weren't accusing them of being atheists. They're accusing them of being superstitious, uh, which was a bigger insult uh, to the pagan community at the time. The intellectual pagans uh, thought less of superstitious people than they did of atheists, although they weren't fond of atheists either, generally. Um, there was a good so, book. So basically, was I, was, I was just saying that in English, modern English usage. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, the All right, I, mean, yeah, so I, I shouldn't harp on this too much because I think semantics is very arbitrary in many ways. So um, as long as we understand what your classification system is, we can work with it. Uh, but yeah, other people, you have different classification systems and how they use the words is different, but yeah. So how, how do you define things like the difference between a polytheist, a handle theist or a monolaterist how, how would you differentiate between those three you asking me or hey, either or okay sure let's go with you oh wait so mono um, well i mean those terms are all self-defining right monolaterist means worship only one yeah. god even though you might believe there are other gods um uh, henotheist is the belief of one supreme god even if there are other subordinate gods um and then I, what was the other one i can't remember polytheist but polytheist is believing there are many gods right so yeah, those are all like subcategories of theism I would say, yeah, yeah, and some of them are compatible, like like henotheism and all well, henothe They're all compatible. You could have all of those beliefs could be the same. You could be a polytheist, a henotheist, and a monolatrist at the same time. I think I know a few of them uh, actually. Right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little bit confusing, but I think I'd actually do know a few. Uh, let me well, just... that the ancient the ancient Jews could probably be categorized as uh, henotheists. The, yes, the, the ancient. Uh, I, I, yeah. That's true, yeah. yeah, and and yeah, some yeah. people have made that point. Some other scholars have. Yeah. Yeah, but when I speak about, uh, you know, the great theistic uh, religions, I'm talking about, you know, the, um, the ontologically simple divine, divine being who, um, you know, is omni-great. Um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. when, when I run into somebody who, you know, said, um, you know, paganism, like Ocean, you know, uh, he, he's... To me, he's a polytheist, not a a, a, a theist in in my book. So, mm -hmm. um, talk about Ocean Keltoy, if people that uh, yeah, may not be yeah. aware of who you're yeah. referring to. Oh, have you had him on the show? Is that who you're talking oh, about? Oh yes. Oh yeah. 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 Interesting. Of okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, uh, he's, he, I, uh, he's actually talked to you before too. Um, when you were on uh, oh, the, right. back, back on I Heretic Woman's channel. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Carrier, what what would your uh, um, why would you believe that uh, in the non-existence of God? What what's your rationalism uh, for your atheist atheism? Well, of course, how, how you, do you, you you know the basic the basic four arguments from my book why I'm not a Christian. Um, and I mean, I could, I mean, frankly, it's a ton of things. Like everything I look at uh, doesn't look favorable for the God hypothesis. I treat the God hypothesis as a hypothesis, and then I test it against alternative hypotheses and see which one naturally fits the evidence better. Uh, and uh, my latest treatment of this for people to look want to see like the complete list of arguments, not complete, but a large list of arguments, is my um, article online uh, called uh, Bayesian Counter Apologetics. So uh, just, just Google Bayesian counter apologetics and you'll find I go through like the 10 standard arguments for God and explain how like actually the evidence supports the other conclusion for each one. Uh, and and there are, a lot of them are standard arguments, you know, like the, the silence argument, the, the, the argument from evil um, and uh, the argument from naturalism, the fact that, you know, science hasn't found supernatural powers or properties despite the fact that it should have by now. Uh, if there were such things, um, various other types of arguments like that, where the, the God hypothesis just does not fit 
uh, the reality that I observe, especially when you see like the diversity of religions and how they change over time. Uh, is, is exactly what you expect if God is something that humans are inventing in their heads, even sincerely, but nonetheless, uh, you would expect it to see to diverge just like languages do. But if there was one true God, there should have been a common thread of the same religion from time immemorial across all cultures, uh, receiving the same revelations, receiving the same gospel for, through all time. Um, that would be more expected. And then if you're going to go back and try to create all these excuses for why God would make the world look exactly like it would look if he didn't exist... Now you're starting to gerrymander the theory of God, and that I, that I find is a problematic way to respond to a failure of a hypothesis. Um, scientists talk about this all the time, of what a bad scientific theory is, is a theory that you're trying to gerrymander to fit the evidence rather than admitting when you should really let go of a theory, the evidence goes against it. And so that, that's the general uh, reason I'm an atheist. Right. It's been a while since I read your book, um, about three years, and I was... Yeah, in, in the book, the four arguments are... Um, well, the argument from silence... Well, here, let's... The argument from silence, the wrong universe theory, like we would have a different universe if God existed. This is the universe that we would have if there wasn't one. Uh, God doesn't do anything, which is the argument from evil, uh, and the evidence isn't adequate. Uh, so a God who wanted us to be saved, who actually cared about us, would give us better evidence than has been given, for example. Uh, those are the four arguments that I present and, and discuss and defend against attacks, too. So, like, I don't just make the arguments. Sure. I, I realize there's right. critics of those arguments. I include the criticisms and, and deal with them in that book. But you generally, right. you wrap it all up into a probabilistic argument of what is more likely to be the case. Exactly. It's, it's all, yeah, it's all probability, and it's all in terms of what is the probability of the evidence? What, what is the more probable evidence you would expect on each theory and then go look at the evidence, see what it matches, right? What what should you expect to see, uh, and which is which thing is what you actually see? And then you come so you compare the evidence with the theory. So it's evidence or it's theory testing, right? It's hypothesis testing, from my perspective. Well, you had mentioned something like the problem of evil, which uh, I, I think obviously is a huge problem when it comes to things like an omnibenevolent God. But if, what's the, what happens if somebody doesn't posit when a, an omnibenevolent God? I know, uh, you know, Kenny does believe that. But let's say that it, you were not speaking to, to Kenny on that. You're talking to somebody else mm -hmm. who believes God exists, <laughs> but he's not omnibenevolent. Can you still use um, uh, some kind of uh, gratuitous problem of evil against that type of deity? Probably not the, the gratuitous evil one. Um, like, if you were to say, like, a God who really doesn't give give a damn about us, right? A god that's more interested in making black holes than people, and people are just fleas on his project. Uh, you know, that you could, if you believe in a god like that, uh, then obviously the, the evil stuff, if, if you have an indifferent god, then the what you would expect from an indifferent god is exactly what we observe, a, a, a universe that seems to be indifferently governed with respect to our interests. Um, but then there's other things. Then you have to say, well, why do you believe that God exists? And so you, then you look at the evidence. You look at like, uh, like, well, what is your reason for even thinking there is such a, a being? And then the more minimal you define your God, the 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 harder it is to even establish a reason to believe that God exists. And so that you know, the as the theory shrinks, so does the evidence, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, now uh, I mentioned I work with uh, reasons to believe. Are you familiar with that organization? Yeah, at all? yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now. When I argue for the existence of God, I use, I'll either um, bypass the beginning of the universe, uh, because I think just the nature of existence and being itself uh, demands uh, one who has existence in and of him or her or itself. Um, but as far as the beginning of the universe... Um, Einsteinian, uh, special general relativity, uh, the way Dr. Ross argues for the beginning of the universe, therefore a God. Why would you not find that um, uh, convincing? I, kind of the same way like I don't buy flat Earth theory, right? Uh, so if I want to know sure. how the universe and why the, how the universe began and why it began the way it did in particular, uh, I want to go talk to cosmological scientists who actually have theories oh. about this and actually adduce evidence for their theories. Now, they haven't fully sussed the whole thing, but their theories actually are better supported by evidence, and they, there's no God in them. Like, they don't need gods to actually explain any of this stuff. Uh, so I, I would wait for like an actual cosmological scientific study that confirmed that the only way that a certain thing could have happened and caused the universe had to be intelligent. Uh, we just don't have that science yet, so there's nothing to back that view. So I think that's a supposition rather than uh, a reasoned argument, and, and that's the way I approach that particular one. It's, it's an unknown. There isn't anything to do with that. I want to hear. You don't, you don't um, think real, real a, a coming to? Okay. Oh, Who, what? Go ahead. Finish your thought. Oh, it's going to run us into a, a long 
Long well, I, okay, what we... <laughs> I kind of wanted to go back to what we were talking about just a second ago um, with the uh, benevolent deity um, topic. And I'm going to ask you, Kenny, um, do you believe that hell is a justifiable punishment for a simple lack of belief? Um, you know, the doctrine of hell is, has its... Uh, um, has its existential uh, struggles, you know, like we all do to think uh, about hell and eternity. So uh, let me just say this. In, in saying what I'm going to say, um, I, with no glee, uh, no joy, but uh, with tears in my heart, say that um, the doctrine of hell is biblical, um, the nature of sin is as such, um, and I do give this illustration when I uh, share this with people. You know, if I were to, and and maybe uh, Steve and Dr. Kerry would like to do this, if I were to go and attack Donald Trump, uh, if I were to attempt to slap him, I would be shot down dead before I even got to that point. Why? Because of the object in which I tried to assault. And I think sin has to be understood in that way, that sin is against this omni-great being. And it's not like my neighbor. If I go slap my neighbor, uh, we're, we're people on equal grounds, and we might you know, not press charges. But even in the attempt to attack the president, I'm going to be shot. So the object of offense has a lot to do with the penalties that are incurred from that offense. I, under, I understand what you're saying with that, but it's, I'm not. It's I'm talking kind about of medieval and aristocratic, attacking. though. Uh, it's kind of arrogance in that way. Uh, in reality, though, the someone who tried to slap Donald Trump has the same human and civil rights as anyone else. In reality, they would just wrestle him to the ground if you're trying to slap him. They would use commensurate force. Well, uh, uh, they're not. They're not allowed to torture the guy. They're not allowed to uh, use incommensurate force. Uh, right, we actually, because we have actually standards of law of, of equity, like like uh, persons are equal. Uh, and it and wouldn't so be an eternal that, punishment either. Yeah, the, the whole so idea don't of, take, don't of, take my, don't take my illustration to be it's a, like a perfect analogy. It's, it's the old French tyrannical, you know, it's the King Louis uh, um, idea that, that because of your social status, an offense against you deserves more punishment than the same offense against someone else is that that's actually archaic medieval thinking. It's not really. Yeah, but what I'm saying is it mindset. would probably shoot first, ask questions later if anybody with their hand in their pocket ran up to well, the because they, that was utilitarian only because they have to. They're not omniscient, right? If they were omniscient and knew right. the hand didn't hold anything, they wouldn't. They would, they would, we'd see the outrageous for them to shoot. It, it's, it's just it's just <laughs> a basic point. It's just a basic point to show um, that the but object it's, that's in it's view. not. The analogy doesn't really work because we don't actually accept the the barbaric moral values that you're using as the analogy. That uh, well, a, a superior being actually is l less harmable than a, okay. an innocent, right? And, and so, it's probably right, more let, forgiving. Let me, let me well, throw this also, one out. Yeah, more knowledgeable, more if forgiving. I, yeah. If I kill a if I kill a cat or kill a human being, what what penalties are going to be incurred for that? With the killing the human being is going to be greater. So the object of the offense is uh, taken into account when the penalty is. And I'm just but we're saying not talking, that, that... We're not well, talking that's... about killing killing anybody. I'm just talking about the simple lack of disbelief. He's just, say, he's just is... saying that if you don't believe, like John 3.16 says, if you, you know, believe in, in Christ and, and you know have faith in him, I, I think what Kyle's saying is if you just don't have any belief like that... Yeah, not hurting anybody, yeah. not doing anything... Should you have eternal punishment? You just don't yeah. believe. You just don't... Right, that's a good you, way to get back to the point. You live a right. good okay. life. You live a good life. You... Um, you do right by others. You don't mess with anybody. What is the justification just for lacking a belief that you should be tortured for eternity? Well, um, biblically speaking, there certainly are levels uh, of punishment, and uh, the Scripture says that we are judged according to our deeds. So God definitely takes into account uh, what we do. Right. Let me let me but, ask but, Richard. But real quick. that that suggests saying then that atheists can be saved. Uh, that you don't need to go through Christ to get into heaven. If if that were the case. No, I'm just saying that, that we are judged according to our deeds. 
uh, as scripture tells us. And that hell, traditionally speaking, um, I see. There so are d- the, the, the there, there's a nice of part of hell, is what you're saying. <laughs> the, the, the upscale <laughs> well, version of hell. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying Adolf quick. Hitler is certainly uh, going to have a more excruciating sure. uh, and exacting okay. punishment for what he did than the little old lady down the road. Um, so <laughs> I, I, the doctrine of hell is is there's not much spoken about it as far as the nature uh, of it. Um, it is but eternal. It, and it is important to note that the only reason you believe it is because it's in Scripture. There, if it wasn't in Scripture, you wouldn't. Well, it, is it, it in Scripture? That, I mean, Richard, let me, let me ask yeah. you real quick if I can. Is there? Well, wait, it, before, are, I yeah, I know what you mean, but before we get to that, like I agree, that's another good tack. But I, I know I'm very curious about this because this is something sure. I normally don't get to ask Christians. Is is if it weren't in Scripture, would you not believe it? Like, would that not be a part of your dogma? Is it only because it's in Scripture that you adopt the the hell doctrine? Well, I I would say this. Uh, because the nature of the universe does scream out for for uh, justice, and uh, in our own uh, reality, there is the idea that uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So there's the sense that justice is ingrained in the nature of reality. So I would expect that in the life to come, there would be this same... Um, correlation that I see. The universe I live in now um, has the sense of justice, and so there must be, this is kind of a C.S. Lewis thing. Yeah, uh, but how do you get to, to infinite, infinite punishment for finite crime is, is the thing. And I, and I know like you got this idea that God is infinite, but therefore you harm him infinitely, but that's actually not true. It's the other way around. Because he's so unharmable, offenses against God are weaker and less significant. It's like shooting someone who's wearing body armor versus shooting, shooting someone who's not, right? It shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't phase God as much. <laughs> right, right. It it's like you, you can't harm him, so it's actually less harm is done uh, by... I, by ag- I agree with so, that. So why, yeah, the why the infinite, impassibility. But why the, yeah, so why the infinite mm-hmm. punishment for the finite crime? I think is that that's what they were trying to get at yes. before. Right, well, let me, let me just say this. Um, and, and, you know, there are things that I believe but when I talk to people, I like to give them, you know, some Christians believe this, some Christians believe this. Uh, there is a growing movement within evangelicalism uh, that is uh, annihilistic, that, you know, mm-hmm. non-being comes uh, as a result of not believing in Christ. That, a- that would seem to the- agree with Paul. I, would, I think Paul was an annihilationist. Uh, so right. I think okay. there's, there's at least tradition to go on on that, but... So, so, yeah, I, I mean, um, it, although I do believe in a, uh, a universe that uh, justice needs to be served, in some way God is going to uh, met out justice, and what that means for the little old lady down the road that didn't harm anybody, I believe <laughs> that that is going to be just. Whatever God does is going to be okay. just. And it no, that, may that's, not that's actually, entail. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean that. That's actually like uh, one of the nicer versions of this that I've heard. From yeah, he's not Christian. saying everybody's <laughs> screwed if they don't think exactly yeah, what yeah, he yeah, does. No, obviously, no, it's, it's interesting but, to hear. But, but yeah. Richard, let me ask you. Um, the the concept we have nowadays in modern times of hell has that been some kind of derivation from the original text when it came to like Sheol and 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 uh, um, what was the other version of Sheol uh, uh, with, with a G. Um, the, oh, Gehenna. Gehenna, yeah, the, thank you. For Gehenna, I mean, are these not derivations of things that the that the ancient Hebrews and, and, and Jews believed at one time, and then was it, was it somehow changed as a conversion technique to try to get people to, to believe a specific way because of fear? Or what do you think came about, uh, okay, the reasons why the a modern lot of version of hell came about? Uh, it certainly oh, the Middle the, Ages, right? Dark, the Middle Ages, Dark Ages, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the, but, the, cha- no, but the, belief, the belief did change significantly over time. Like, there's a different belief in the afterlife in the Old Testament than we find in the New Testament. Uh, and the different Jewish sects had different views. Uh, so there's a lot of different views as to what happened in the afterlife and what hell was like, if there even was one. Mm-hmm. Um, there, was di- there were dif- disagreements even on whether there was one. Uh, and that, that's all the way goes back thousands of years. And then 
most of the popular conception of hell, the stuff you see in the movies and the stuff you see, like, you know, street side preachers who have these assumptions about what hell is like, it, it comes mostly from Dante. I mean, frankly, it's, it's all That's Dante. That's what I would uh, think, yeah. And, and if it hadn't been for Dante, we wouldn't have this vision. But there, there are, Dante got his stuff by combining sources from other different things. So like you have, like, the Apocalypse of Peter. A lot of the traditional view of hell comes from the Apocalypse of Peter, where there is this... Uh, underground world where there's people burning and being tortured horribly um not by satan because satan is actually one of the people being tortured uh being, being tortured by god's angels god sends his angels down yeah, to satan is like at the ninth people. level he's like frozen <laughs> yeah and dante yeah, yeah and Dante's uh, right, inferno, yeah. He's, he's, but, but you notice the common view is that satan is somehow a ruler of hell uh that, no, that's he's another down view. there if i remember correctly right, right. Inferno, but that's yeah. another, the ruler of hell thing is another concept that evolved in the middle ages and then and became sort of somehow in the modern mindset but that's not I don't think that's anywhere in scripture. Yeah, uh, yeah and, in the Old uh, Testament, um, Sheol was really uh, a place of no knowledge, uh, no yeah, understanding, sleep, kind of almost right. a soul sleep kind of a, yeah, exactly. of a thing. You could, so, you could wake a soul up with magic and talk to them, but then they would go back to sleep again. There was, it was more like the, the idea of Hades, the original, and the, or the Sumerian view of the afterworld. Was, was, there was a lot of similarities in the ancient Near East in this, this idea. It was a sort of a sad place where people were mostly forgetful and didn't remember stuff um and, and you know you even have like the greek view of hades where most of the dead would drink from the river lath and would forget everything uh right so uh so there's and and of course then you have the idea of the reincarnation would be built in from some like plato argues for but the, there are a lot of different views but the idea of the burning hell comes originally from zoroastrianism and and it wasn't an eternal thing zoroastrianism's view was that if you were a bad person you would burn uh, until the end of the world, and when there'd be a final conflagration and everything would be burned up, even all the impurities in your soul, so like all the sin in you would be burned away, literally physically burned away, and then you would be purified. And then people who are good would be able to avoid this this one purgation process. And then, of course, the Catholic Church then took purgatory and took that idea and turned it into purgatory, which is where we get purgatory as an idea. Uh, but this view was outside in Judaism for a while. It's, it sneaks into Stoicism. So you see like Stoic theology had this idea of the, a temporary purg purgation that's sort of based on the degree of your sin that would burn away your sins and then you would become purified later uh, by the process. And, and so the, that crept into Judaism and then through Judaism into Christianity. Uh, so a lot of that uh, comes from there. Uh, and, and it's a lot of different weaves and threads, different views from different religions and it evolved over time that's sure now as to the why why did it change i i have not examined that enough to really be able to answer that question for you um uh, uh alan siegel wrote a book uh the afterlife uh which i don't have right it's here somewhere but uh <clears> that <throat> does a really good survey of ancient afterlife beliefs um it's probably one of the best treatises to read a scholarly treatise on the different views in antiquity and i think it goes up into the middle ages um, as to the different views and where they came from, and he has some theories as to why they changed, but uh, uh, I'm not an expert in that. I, I, I really think that because of um, a lot of the cultural things, a lot of the, uh, the forces outside of, you know, kind of this presuppositional uh, idea of coming to the text with preconceived ideas. You know, say you've got Dante in your mind and you're coming to right, the text. Yes, uh, right, yes, right. Mm -hmm. You're going to read those things into the text. So yeah. uh, for me, I, I'm actually at the place right now where I have uh, I have need of revisiting uh, the doctrine of hell, but it's so low on my, I, you know, on, on my to-do list Um but I really do need to revisit it and get right back down to the New Testament, what it was saying, what it's not saying, and not allowing a lot of this tradition to uh, inform me of, mm -hmm. of what yeah. uh, the New Testament yeah. saying. So, Interesting. Um, right. so yeah. I, I'm suggesting even in Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus, uh, he did some significant things uh, in order to... Um, be spoken so harshly about by Christ. So um, that was one who who really significantly brought harm on another human being. And uh, I mean, there may be you know uh, different kinds of punishment um, that mm -hmm. are made it out like that. So I just I think it re really needs to be revisited by evangelical scholarship today, and not allowing. Um, the baggage of the uh, Middle Ages. Although I love uh, a lot about uh, medieval theology, I'm a Thomist. I love uh, Thomas Aquinas, 
Um, but even he had some, you know, some some things that he <laughs> didn't get right. But uh, <laughs> sure, yeah. uh, I, I think it's very good, a very good thing to be open minded, uh, to really, um, you know, be be open to the, the the proposition that you could be wrong. Mm-hmm. And um, the, well, I'm the, curious to circle back to where we started on this. Uh, to, right back to the beginning of biblical epistemology, uh, with the parable of Lazarus, like I mean, you, you're you're speaking as though you take it as Jesus would only give a literal story, so that it's literal flames. Actually, everything is literally. Or, or would you allow that maybe the parable, because it is just a parable, like Jesus isn't really saying it's historically true. Uh, is the could the parable just be allegory for something? This he's not meaning a literal eternal flames, but there's something else, some other form of suffering. Uh, and, and it's just the, the, the other, the point of the story is the point of the story rather than the literal details. Uh, right. How, I, well, how, I, how I much don't would believe, you, I don't how, how much would you allow is, for that is what I'm thinking. Yeah. But well, I don't, I don't believe hell is necessarily a literal fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's certainly, uh, uh, uh allegorical, uh, okay. metaphor, yeah. figurative. So, um, there, there is, there is. Uh, some uh, retribution that's going to take place in the afterlife for deeds done in the body. And um, Hmm. we have these descriptions of it in the New Testament. And um, at this point, all I have is the traditional view of hell uh, that's in my brain. Um, So there there may be, uh, you know, some some changes of thought in in my mind. Uh, I'm just like everybody else you know, wanting to find the truth. Um, again, the idea of sin being far more serious uh, as against a holy God, I think needs to be considered in all of the, you know, all of the talk as well. But, um, so yeah, I, I hope I'm not accused of, uh, of being a softy or vacillating. <laughs> but uh, I, I want to oh, yeah, be... No, it's, it's a reasonable... Wanna, really, you're taking a reasonable yeah. tack, I get it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I... I it's hard to be dogmatic on um, some of this stuff that you, you just... Yeah. Number one, I'm not an expert on the doctrine of hell. <laughs> you know, number two, um, I haven't looked into it uh, the way I probably <laughs> should should have anyway. So Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we got... Uh, the, the, the live chat is um, blowing up with, with questions, so if you just don't <laughs> mind, we're going to... Um, sure, yeah. ...ask a couple, um, and I'll let Steve pick out a couple of those and um, fire away. Yeah, one of, the, one of the first questions that actually came up, and a lot of them come by, and, and I missed a lot of them, so if people want to repeat them, that's just fine. But one of the, one of the first questions that was actually brought up was brought up by uh, Pine Creek, which was a very good question to uh, you, Kenny. Um, you, had an, uh, you had said that a lot of you, the reasons you believe the way you do is because these things were written um, prior to 70 AD or early on. And the question he had asked is, if, these, if the things in the Bible were written long afterwards, if it wasn't either contemporary with Jesus or soon after, as you had, had stated, would you still have the same effect uh, of believing if, if it wasn't written as when you think it was? If it was written long after the fact, would it would it matter to you from a belief standpoint? Uh, yes, it, it would matter to me. If it could be proven that the Gospels were not uh, eyewitness testimony, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And like I said, if Christ has not risen from the dead, even as the Apostle Paul said, we might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Uh, yeah, it, it would change uh, It would change my opinion, certainly. It wouldn't take me out of theism, but it would certainly uh, make me rethink a lot of stuff if uh, all the Gospels are second century um, um, forgeries. That's yeah. interesting well, would, you say that. I, I would I, think late yeah. late first century would be the more more likely uh, than second century. Late first so, century. So, yeah, well, late, that's see, the, late, the late, mainstream late dates are all late late first century yeah. is the usual date. And late them. first century to me is within the generation of the eyewitnesses within this oral community that. Uh, well, it wouldn't. It wouldn't really be because average life expectancy was forty eight. Uh, so, um, like I think less than one percent of people survived to eighty. And so, if you're an adult in the 30s, you're you're dead by the 70s, basically. Um, so, so late late first century is definitely a next generation thing, uh, and, and we don't have been, any evidence. We don't have any evidence that there were witnesses. That myth after. doesn't enter in within 30 years. 
of any well, historical. actually, we, we have lots of examples of that happening in other in other traditions. Uh, that's the, uh, uh, the Craig I, Craig argument. Uh, he's wrong. There's some good articles on that. There's some good articles on that. There's a good one online somewhere. I can't remember it now. Uh, where someone really took that to task. Um, I've written about it in The Empty Tomb, edited by Jeffrey Lauder and Robert Price. Uh, I talk about the, the the faulty evidence in that. And as an ancient historian, I mean, this is what I study. So, like, we have, we have lots of examples of rapid legendary development um, in, in different forms. Uh, so that that's not... It, it, the thing that would be With, weird would be for... Within 30 years? Within 30 years, do you have an example? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, f f an example of what exactly, though? What do, what do you mean? A, a, uh, myth, a significant myth, say, being able to take a, the core that Jesus rose from the dead and that being a total myth that was brought in um, 30 years later. And We have that in modern, modern times. We've got the Roswell UFO crash. Uh, within 30 years, we've got a complete flying saucer and alien bodies autopsied by the government. That's within 30 years, and it yeah, started with this and oil the in the desert. That's not. I the think thing. it kind of is, and that's in a, a period of universal, <laughs> universal <laughs> literacy and newspapers and photographs. Uh, in antiquity, you didn't have any of those things. So if it could happen in the 20th century, it can happen in the first. But we, we have, yeah, we have okay. examples. We have lots of stuff in Herodotus. That, that's, that's like saying um, that the, the non holocausters could be right. Wait, Most what? Holocausts are, the the, the non-Holocaust... Uh, I don't get the analogy, sorry. Okay, the Jewish Holocaust from uh, Adolf yeah, yeah, but how, how does this map onto the Roswell case? Well, what I'm saying is is uh, we have people that are denying that today. We're outside of the eyewitness testimony Order. of that, but we have significant, uh, significant documentation within the generation of the eyewitnesses yeah, that, and that, but that's like a massive yeah. event involving millions of people. That's not like a private event that was only seen by supposedly a few people. Because uh, we, we have the example of like Mormonism. And like we've got another example of like these wild stories that, that Joseph Smith fabricated. Uh, and then multiple witnesses, you know, attesting that parts of it, which I'm sure they're lying. Um, but that, you know, that's an example. We, we have uh, in Herodotus, uh, we have examples of, of rapid legendary development. I give examples uh, in the empty tomb when I talk about this part of it. Uh, there are others. Um, you know, we, we, we can look at a variety of different examples of uh, the way myth evolves. Uh, there are people who studied uh, oral oral uh, transmission actually found that the, this happens a lot. These stories evolve much more rapidly than has been claimed a lot. Uh, and then also parapsychology investigators. So uh, Joe Nickel and James Randi have investigated modern myths of a variety of different kinds. Uh, and when you go investigating, and these are all within the lifetime of witnesses still living, you go investigating them, the truth turns out to be very different from the stories that were told. Uh, Near-death experience stories are another category of these, where you have these these mythologies get developed over time out of like kernels of truth, but the kernels of truth are very give a paint a very different picture when you start looking at them. Uh, there's uh, Keith Augustine wrote, uh, did a book, an extensive one on the afterlife, uh, myth of the afterlife, I think it's called, um, where there's a lot of these examples where he covers these, showing how these myths evolve over time quite quickly, like within the lifetime of people still living. Uh, so so that, if that can happen in modernity, it was much more easily uh, happening in antiquity where you had most mostly illiteracy, very little access to documents, n no photographs, no newspapers, um, and then much more but credulous are, But are we talking about the same kind of situation that, that uh, Bailey speaks about in the sense that there was a teacher, there were students, and the students held on to holy tradition by memorizing what the teacher said. Well, that's the thing. It's right that there. has turned you're, into myth you're within thirty years. You're, see, but you're you're assuming that's the case. If there no, is, I mean, then that didn't happen, good right? Scholarship so you, you have to you have to understand if you're comparing the alternative hypothesis, you have to credit the alternative hypothesis and work it out and say like, what would be the case if the alternative hypothesis is true? The alternative hypothesis is that there wasn't an oral tradition, that there wasn't this thing passed on by eyewitnesses. So if, if you grant that that wasn't the case, then of course you could have this wild uh, mythology develop within 30 years. Obviously, yes, if there's some sort of but real sure, if you, controlled if you get structure. rid of the facts, you could. Yeah, <laughs> that's not a fact. It's That's a, that's hypothesis, right? There's, that there was an oral tradition that was policed is a hypothesis. We actually don't have any direct evidence because we have no information about what was going on in the 30 years between uh, the death of Jesus and the Gospels. We don't but have... It's, still, uh, it's, it's actually a have. phenomenon still in the Eastern cultures today. It's Which, a phenomenon that's, a, that's around today. You mean the oral transmission stuff? Yeah. 
the oh, yeah. no, culture, I'm that's the nature you, I'm of the you, look, culture. Look at, Whedon, look at Whedon and some of the other people who've actually studied uh, oral transmission. It, it doesn't go the way you think. Uh, no, the, no, the reality is oral when transmission a teacher, rapidly evolves. No, it rapidly evolves when, and easily changes. Yeah, and we no, have but a, when there's a teacher, a student, and a core of teaching, it doesn't happen that quick. Socrates. Like, if, uh, if, about policing the, the, if, if, if there's some sort of traditional unit that's policing the tradition, that's the hypothesis, not the fact. You, you're, you're, you need to like prove that that actually existed. We, we don't have any evidence that that actually existed. That's exactly the issue that's at, at stake we, here. They're we do with uh, rabbinic Judaism. But Christianity isn't rabbinic Judaism. <laughs> uh, yeah, rabbinic but, Judaism but they were Jews. Only, only had reliable and, transmission for the mission. Paul was a rabbi. Yeah, but, but only the Mishnah had reliable transmission, and that's because they had Mishnah schools. They had a whole institution, actual physical schools, where they had kids come in and drilled them for years and years and years. We don't have any evidence that that existed for Christians. Do you see, you see the difference, right? There's, like, we, we, have Mishnah, it in the con we have evidence for the Mishnah schools. We don't have evidence for any comparable institution in Christianity, which makes the assumption that there was such an institution a hypothesis, not a fact. Right? You, you now, need I facts. I get what you're saying there, certainly. Yeah, I get right? what you're so, saying there. Yeah, but what so I'm that, saying is that it's a, it's and the a, competing it's, hypothesis is that, that there wasn't, right? So, so your your two hypotheses are that there was and that there wasn't, and that's what you're you're testing, uh, and we just don't have evidence to decide this, uh, it, or you know, uh, direct evidence from the period in which we're we're concerned as to what was going on. No one's telling us what's going on in the Christian community in those thirty years. We we don't have data, uh, w unlike we do for Mormonism, for example. We have really good documentation for early Mormonism. Uh, would that we had such documentation for early Christianity, we could resolve a lot of these. Disputes. I, I, I think I think the the scholarship on that is is in disagreement with you on oral but, transmission. Uh, I know the fundamentalists but, are, but, but I'm just, I'm relying on the actual science, which is anthropology uh, and folklorists uh, who actually study this. Uh, and I do cite a lot of the the studies on this. Um, it's in I have some in on the historicity of Jesus. I do in the empty tomb, I think too. But I think it's on the historicity of Jesus where I have most of the literature cited on oral transmission. Uh, but but yeah, you got you got to not look at the apologists. You got to look at the actual scientists doing the studies of oral transmission, uh, and that's that's anthropologists, uh, folklorists, and linguists uh, are the people writing these studies. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I get your point. I, I I do understand your point. But again, um, I think there the the fact of these uh, oral creeds that were in existence that Paul was able to uh, reiterate to the Corinthians. Uh, you've got uh, Philippians that has oral no, creeds. Notice, in that, it. notice that that creed is not in any gospel. The, the 1 Corinthians 15, the sequence of events described there is not described in any gospel. It, it's lost. Whatever that creed was disappeared by the time the gospel um, was written. Is that, uh, yeah, that's that's a, an assumption. I, I, well, no, I we, don't, we don't. So he describes but, an appearance to Kephas and then to the Twelve. Uh, and then to uh, the 500, and then to James, and then to the other apostles. That sequence of events doesn't appear in any of the Gospels. Uh, okay, there, but there, again... No initial because... appearance to Peter. Uh, there's no subsequent appearance to the 12 after appearing to Peter. Uh, there's not even an appearance to 12, because one of them's dead. Uh, so the Gospels have changed that. Uh, there's no appearance to the 500, uh, or, or the hundreds. I... Uh, and then there's no appearance to James, and much less... Uh, to the apostles. I get so, what you're saying that that Paul only wrote about these certain things, but, but I have a great, that was an oral creed that that was memorized and passed on to him. Notice that well, that, that creed is I, gone. It's gone by the time the gospels are written. So so clearly the original creed has dissolved. It's been transformed well, you, you, into something else. Well, there was certainly uh, a Pauline corpus of material that was being circulated from day one. But and, I, that's not my point, though. Is my point and, is that the oral creed that you're talking about that we have in Paul. It has vanished by the time the Gospels are written. So the argument that why the Gospels be, preserve it is not tenable from that. But why would it need to be in the Gospels if it was already in the Pauline corpus that was being passed to the churches to begin oh, with? You're, you're the one arguing that it was memorized without change over decades and decades. Clearly that's not the case. About, whatever was being memorized, known to Paul, whatever was Paul was handing on is is disappeared. Like the, No one's been policing it. No one's still telling those stories. So something else happened. It transformed oh. radically. By the time we get to the Gospels, we've got some completely different thing. Uh, so that, that shows that I, I, that old I tradition... I think we're going to have to have a wrap-off to finish this. We <laughs> have to have a wrap-off at this point. I'm terrible. You at want that. me to drop some beatbox going on? You're, you're yeah. a drummer. You, you probably already got better rhythm in terms of rapping. Than I do. So. Well, he's a drummer, so yeah, probably. 
we better get to the questions because we only got what five more. Oh, yeah. Minutes. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, obviously, I'm not going to be able to get to even the vast majority of these questions. Um, so I'm kind of just picking and choosing at but, random here. But I would like to, <laughs> I would like to talk to Dr. Though. Awesome I would like to talk to Carrier again, uh, just on the existence of God, you know, get into my uh, yeah. area. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. That'd be uh, great. Yeah, I mean, it would be, we could talk about it after. Um, it'll be some months before I'll be free again, but I would love to be on again. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And maybe, uh, are you over in the Bay Area? Very occasionally. No current plans, but it can happen. Usually you Sacramento. Sure? What's that? Oh, okay. Sacramento. Well, I'm, I'm only an hour from Sacramento. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm I have just no saying, saying we could keep in touch and maybe go to lunch or something. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, well, I'll forget. So uh, <laughs> if, if you keep an eye on my... We'll, we'll handle my all the scheduling. My, my we'll, Facebook, we'll take care of you guys. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry, yeah, yeah. you got so it covered. Okay, yeah. Look at this um, bromance. Yeah, no, someone has to ask me and say, oh, I saw you're announcing that you're going to be in Sacramento. Hey, do you want to hang out for lunch? And then I'll go, oh, yeah, for sure. Otherwise, I have too many people. I can't keep track of everyone. <laughs> he's a popular guy is what he's saying. <laughs> I have so many friends. <laughs> <laughs> I did meet your buddy, uh, David Fitzgerald, though. Right, yeah. He's in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he came over, uh, and I, uh, I kind of, uh, you know, uh, Secretly came into the atheist party they were having there. To right. Okay. <laughs> in and, and, see, uh, and and you know I wanted to check the animal sacrifices and, and all the black, Satan war black magic Satan worship that was going on in there. You know? <laughs> Again. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I yeah. think this was a great discussion, and I think it is definitely time to start wrapping it up. Uh, I want to thank both of you for coming in. I know uh, th these are these events take some planning, and uh, Kenny, thank you very yeah. much for coming in last minute. Obviously, we had yeah, some awesome. things are changing, but you know, Richard was 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 with us the entire time. Uh, he he definitely uh, kept in touch with us, and so I want to thank both you guys for scheduling this to fit into your, your day to day. Um, I know a lot of things have yeah. changed from our original plans, but I think this worked out exceptionally well. So I'm going to, I'm going to toss this back to Kyle here. He's going to kind of take us out and, uh, we'll, we'll figure out a way to arrange you guys having another discussion about God, sure. um, yeah. in a couple months or so when, when, when Rich is a little more free, but Kyle, yeah. you want to take us out? Cause I got, I got the, I got the Twitter at 4 a.m. this morning I and I just have to he see it when lying. I rolled over in bed. <laughs> I know, I'm all messaging at like 4 a.m. I need somebody for talking to Carrier. Help me. We we totally know what we're doing. <laughs> but um, yes, I, I echo Steve's um, thanks for you guys coming in. Um, it was a fantastic discussion. Um, just a reminder to everyone, tomorrow at 7, we have the discussion between Aaron Ra and Kent Hovind. Um <laughs> That's going to be. It, Dr. Carrier mentioned earlier at the beginning that um, not all discussions or you know talks can go very um, smoothly or gentlemanlike, and tomorrow will be a great example of that. So we're going to give you. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to give you both a dichotomy of how to have not so great a conversation tomorrow. I think <laughs> we're going to. It'll be a good conversation. Yeah, oh, it'll but be I awesome. Think that this. This but week we're going to kind of show you different. both sides. So you got the gentleman tonight, and tomorrow you get the brawlers. Exactly. Um, this is the scalpel um, tomorrow. Tomorrow it's the hammer. So. Yeah. Um, also, we are um, starting to do a new segment each week uh, with Pamela Whistle. She is the membership director of um, American Atheist. She's been on a couple times, but um, we're going to be doing a segment called "What the Mail," where Pam will come on once a week and read all the hate mail and play voicemails that she gets from the oh, american man. atheists yeah so right. um that's going to be a really cool thing that we'll do once a week and um and then saturday we're going to do another live event um it, it's going to be kind of is impromptu um for our ad hominem spinoff that we um do but we're going to ha actually have a flat earth discussion on saturday and that's going to be with kirsten banks who is an astronomy educator at the sydney observatory she is so awesome. we actually oh, nice. yeah um, so that's going to be a really good um, talk, I think, and um, you'll get to you know definitely see something entertaining. So join us for that. Um, if you feel like um, being a part of the show and deciding um, what kind of topics that we talk about, and getting access to first questions, and getting the podcast actually a day early, you can support um, Non Sequitur by going to Patreon.com/slash Non Sequitur and. With that, we're going to leave you with a little teaser for tomorrow. Um, once again, thank you guys for joining us, and everybody out there, 
have a wonderful rest of your evening. And thank you very yeah. much for joining us tonight.